All right. Should we do the hand clap? Let's all let's all do the hand clap. <laughs> wow, we, we were way <laughs> off on that. Good morning, Trust Engine and Win by Noon Productivity Mastermind Group. I am Deborah Bird with Plug and Play SM, and I am actually missing my partners today. Dave Savage is with Renee Rodriguez doing another Amplify, and Todd Bookspan is on a plane about to do another Exactly What to Say certification with Phil M. Jones. But don't you guys worry, because I have a co-host today that finally we're going to outnumber the mail card on these things. And uh, Kristen, good morning. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Happy to have um, some women energy and thrilled to be here with Joe. Um, I am the executive director of First Home IQ and have been here with you guys in the past. Um, but I'm thrilled to have Joe on the call. He is an ambassador at First Home IQ and a top producer and just amazing human being. So um, we're going to have fun today. All right. Well, Joe, no. This is the story of my life, by the way, ladies. I'm I'm oh, out really? daughtered at home. Even the dogs are females. <laughs> like this is this is that girl dad life 101. I'm always outnumbered by the females. Oh, this is perfect. <laughs> so you'll be right at home. Yeah. Right at home. Yes. Yes. So to to start the call, I mean, my goodness, you you chose the title How to Be the Best Mortgage Advisor, not just in the country, but on the planet. So I'd yeah, love to know was... a little bit more of, of what made you choose this as your title, and then also give us just a little bit of an introduction to you and your practice. Yeah, that that's so funny. So I had a I had a couple of friends text message me about that, and they were like, "Wow, you're really going for it, Soto." And I was like, "Wow, oh, you know, I, that's not how I was going for it, but we went we're for kind it." Kind of so rethinking gonna, that. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> You know, so my my thought was, listen, it, it's crazy times for our realtor partners. The market, like everybody was banking on rates being 5%, right? And they're not, and it's not planning the way we thought it was going to be, but we have to be better than we ever have. We have to be more valuable. I think I just finished the book by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Be Valuable. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read it, it's super great. And I think that is like my mantra for 2024 is as loan officers, as advisors, we have to be more valuable than we ever have on so many different levels. And so, yeah, that means you got to be the best loan officer on the planet. You've got to be the best version of you every single day when you show up, because that's what it's going to take to grind out this year. We thought this year was going to be roses. Like we're going to get refis. It's going to be great. Like wah, wah, wah. Truth is, this is the market and it might be seven, eight percent whatever, this is what we're going to do. So that's kind of where that came from. But yeah, it turned into a pretty good headline there, right? Good. Yeah. Good well, and I feel like just from a lot of the loan officers that I'm speaking to and even branch managers, they, they feel like they are working harder than they've ever worked. Like the grind mode is there and the results aren't coming in yet. So it feels like, gosh, I'm, I'm working so hard and I, I don't, see the fruits of that labor yet. So, you know, during this call, we'll, we'll break down some of the things that you're personally doing, but for those who haven't heard any of your prior interviews, tell them a little bit about, you know, where you're based out of, what's your production, like what's your team, and then we'll dive into some tactics of, you know, things that are working for you for this year. Yeah, cool. So I'm in Southern California. I'm in the, like Anaheim, Long Beach area. So not like the coast, you know, OC homes that you see on the TV. Uh, closer to Disneyland than anything else, right? Closer to, close to the mouse. Um, been in the business 20 years. Uh, my team is three three people on my team. I just hired two more. Um, so I'm I'm in growth mode. I, I think a lot of the top producers are looking at this as an opportunity to take market share. So, you know, we're we're hungry, right? Like you see a lot of the people that come on this, like we are going for it right now where a lot of people are scared. Um, production wise, I'm super stoked. Uh, this month's going to be my best month since COVID. Um, last year was, was a, a down year. I was down like 13%, but I think I finished the year almost 70 million last year, which was pretty good for a down year, right? Like we can make a pretty good living off of that. Um, and yeah, this month's going to be great. I got 22, 23 on the board, which is a lot for Orange County, right? I'm not in like Texas where everybody does 20 deals. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're putting our best month, thank God, together this month than we have since COVID. 
Um, so oh. it's really a super blessing. And it's just been like what you said, Deborah. it's grinding, pounding the stone, doing a lot of that grunt work. And then you see, and you're like, oh, wow, like contracts are coming in people like that's all purchased, right? Like they're not a refund on the board. Um, so, so it's crazy town here in Joe's life. Like every escrow is quick, quick, quick. Uh, but that's the team team. I've got a couple of front end people. Um, I've got a team captain that helps manage the team admin. So, but yeah, we're growing and um, I'm super excited. Looking forward to the rest of this year. And while we're looking at, you know, what your business looks like, uh, what's your ratio of first time home buyers to, to move up buyers? Ooh, probably that's a good stat to keep Kristen. I would say it's probably <laughs> oh, yeah. 80, 85% first time home buyers. Wow. wow. Yeah. It's a lot of, of, people getting in the game for the first time, you know, and I think that's why I love uh mortgage coach and just going through the teaching aspect of it because people don't know, right? Like these people are engineers or doctors or nurses or truck drivers, right? Like they don't know APR or mortgage or contingency. So that's our job, you know? Yeah, definitely want to dig into some of the education best practices and maybe look at a rent versus zone and, um, you know, share some specifics around that. Um, and then would also love to touch on how you're bringing value to realtors, given the the NAR settlement and, and all of that. But Deb, I'll let you take the lead. Well, so I, I wanted to to poke a little bit on the amount of first time home buyers that you have, because I feel like... Um, you know, this market, if it couldn't have gotten any more challenging for them just with affordability, now there's a potential, you know, NAR settlement where they may have to even pay for the buyer's agent commission. And so I'm curious of the ones that you've worked with so far, what do you feel has been their main motivator or like pain point of I'm, I'm no longer going to either rent anymore, or I'm tired of living with mom and dad. And so is, is there a pattern to like the trigger of what's causing them to be like, you know what, enough's enough, or is it just lease is about to run out? So they're naturally in that phase. So I think it's a couple of things. I think it's one, the landlord's going to sell. So pressure, mm. right. This is, I have to make a move. Um, two is uncle Sam, you know, they, their accountant has told them, Hey, you guys make a lot of money. You should, you're either going to pay uncle Sam or you're going to pay your mortgage. Who do you want to pay? Um, so there's some of that. And then I think in my area specifically, it's just been, people have been waiting for prices to drop mm. and they're not yeah. right. So they finally are saying, all right, we just got to suck it up. Right. And people got comfortable with 6% rates, 7% rates. They just said, this is it. And we're banking on, you know, being able to refi in the future. But I think a lot of it is just the homes are selling, you know, the rents are going up, rents are going up, but the mortgage prices, like, you know, a mortgage, a good million dollar mortgage out here is a boatload of money, you know? Yeah. So I think that's what's pushing most people. And we, we did have a question from Paul asking about what percent of your business comes from specific, you know, referral sources or any of these first time home buyers or just overall group of business consumer direct, or is it mostly, you know, referral partner agent based or where does, where does that come from? Probably right now, it's probably about 80% 80, 80 realtor, 15% uh, is probably the other 10 and 10 are business partners, financial planners, CPAs, and then past clients, you know, who have referred somebody. That past client window has, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking to more and more of them, but they're just not as, you know, we're not, we're not as top of mind as we should be. And I do a great job on staying in front of those people, but. You know, and that's most of it. You, most of it is agents. You know, Paul, it's it's being consistent. It's making the calls. It's calling with something of value. It's giving without getting anything back, right? You're going to make a lot of those calls and make a lot of those connections and get no leads. And be you have to be okay with getting no leads. And eventually you'll get a lead and eventually it'll turn into a deal. But the more of those swings you take, they will turn into deals. You just have to be willing to put in the reps, right? Mm -hmm. That's where I'm, I'm not emotional about it. I'm like, okay, cool. Just bang through the calls. Right. Hmm, that's good. So do you, do you have a set calendar or like theme days that you follow? Cause, um, you know, I think if we're titling this, the best mortgage advisor, I, I would believe that means you probably have 
you know, strategies and a plan when you show up and, you know, versus being reactive. So can you kind of walk us through your, your yeah. daily schedule for most weeks? It's chaos. Um, no, so I'm very, <laughs> that's an honest answer, right? Yeah. I mean, you get lots of honest answers from me. It'll be totally unscripted. That's all we I want. Think, yeah. I didn't think Joe was going to say that, but there it comes. Um, so I do follow my core theme days, right? On, okay. on Mondays, I call, I typically call realtors. Tuesdays, I call everybody who's in the pipeline, everybody in process, right? Wednesdays, for me, I call old leads. So I'm really, you know, if I go, somebody goes through it, we haven't gotten on the phone. Wednesdays, we do old lead calls. Thursdays, I call pre-approved clients. So it's anybody who's got a pre-approval letter out, right? I want to stay in front of those people because if they've gone through my process and they're out shopping, I can't lose them. Right. Like that's the most frustrating thing as a loan officer is like you do everything right. And then they get into escrow and use somebody else. Yeah. And most of the time, who do we blame? We blame the client, right? Mm -hmm. I can't believe Deborah went with somebody else. But the reality is, is you didn't stay in relationship with them. You didn't stay in contact with them. So there was no connection to you the way the realtor has a connection driving them around all the time. So then you lose them. So that's an important day of the week to stay in front of those people who are shopping and looking. Um, specifically, like right now, when rates change, right? We had a dumpster fire of a day two days ago, right? Rates went way up. Everybody looked. They saw the bond market, closed their laptops. They were like, forget it. Today's over. Um, but that's when you need to talk to those people because when they get into contract and you quote them this higher rate, all of a sudden they're going to want to shop you and leave you. That's just what's going to happen. Not, the best loan officer in the world is going to, they're going to look and go, Oh, Joe's rate is seven. Let me see if somebody's got six, nine, nine. It just happens. So you have to have Uber communication on Thursdays. Um, and then Fridays are for past clients. I typically reach out to past clients, invite them to a trust seminar, um, follow up on their home values. I love to talk to past clients about how much their homes have gone up because they love to talk about that. Aren't you mm. so lucky you bought at the best time? Now it's great. You talk to somebody who's got a six and a quarter. Dude, they're so grateful. They're like, Joe, thank you for getting me that six and a quarter. Dude, you're the man. I appreciate you. And I'm like, do you have any friends that want an eight? I can give them an 8% today or seven and a half, but you get the idea. So yeah. And I've got lists. I mean, I think the big thing for loan officers out there is have a targeted list. Like I have probably a 200 agent list of that, that I cycle through and call, right? Like I'm just trying to stay in front of them. So the days of just calling 40 or 30, that's not enough. Like you need to be in contact with more of them. And you need to call them with something of value every time. You know, what, that's that's the best thing. What when you say value, like what what do your conversations look like these days? Like what kind of value are you bringing to them in those conversations? So I, I am a professional seed planter, right? I am just planting seeds and hoping something grows. So for me, typically my 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 best go to one is. Hey, Deborah, it's Joe. We do the small talk, right? Da, 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 da. Hey, do you have any buyers that are looking to improve, uh, increase their pre-approval? Anybody you're working with right now who maybe if they qualified for five would appreciate 550? Nope, everybody's good because they always say everybody's good. Cool. Well, if you have any clients you're out there showing and maybe they want to qualify for a little bit more, let me know because we've been able to help some people qualify for more. And I know every dollar counts, especially when you're in multiple offer situations. Cool. I'll let you know next time. Boom. I've planted that seed. Odds are one of their buyers, if they're working with any buyers, are going to want to qualify for more. They're approved with the credit union. They're approved with somebody. And they're going to go, I got this guy, Joe, who said he can qualify you for more. Meanwhile, they're not really friends with me. Let's be honest. We're not in the friend zone. But I planted that seed. And it could be any seed. It could be, hey, do you work with self-employed buyers? You know, we've got a great program for self-employed borrowers. Next time you have somebody that's self-employed, think about me because I'd love to help them make sure they maximize their approval, right? Hey, do you have anybody? Like it could be any specific thing, right? We've got a great P&L program. You have any self-employed borrowers who are having a hard time getting pre-approved? We've got this awesome P&L program. I've got an awesome bridge loan. 
So I'll cycle through those 200 and talk about that same program for all 200. Or I'll talk about that same topic for all 200. So the first 10 or 20 times, I suck at it, right? <laughs> but after that 10th, I've got that thing down. I'm like, this is good. I'm in a roll, right? So that's my advice is don't try to reinvent the wheel. Take a couple of things that your company does and just promote that every time. And if you plant enough of those seeds, next time they have a client and the credit union qualified them for 600 and they're looking at homes for 650, they're going to think about you. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want. You just want the shop. So I have a two-part question to that. Um, one, how do you qualify the agents that you put on that list? Like, are you using tools and looking at a production count or are these agents that you've maybe worked with before in the past, maybe on the listing side? Um, so that's the first part of the question. So I'll let you answer that one first. So we do, we have a, a program that we use to qualify, to look at how many closings they've had and how many buy size specifically. Um, and so that's how I pick my targeted list. And then some of them are people that have come to my events in the past that I've looked up their production and I kind of know. So it is a targeted list. In the beginning, Joe called anybody with the pulse, <laughs> right? If you had a real estate license, I was going to call you. And then you know what was wild is they weren't sending me any deals. Mm -hmm. You know why, Deborah? Why? They had no deals to send me. Yeah. I was like, Proud Joe. I made all these calls today. I called a bunch of nobodies. So yes, you have to have a qualified list. Well, and I, I, I speak to a lot of loan officers, usually just through the initial discovery process for social media. And sometimes we have clients that are so hopeful that social will be like that magic pill or magic button to just get, you know, a bunch of leads come in or to avoid doing the phone calls because so many sometimes have a list, but to make that call, they get so scared and they, it's just getting over that fear. And so, um, I, I wanted to hear, and it sounds like this is true. Some of the agents, they know you and some of them don't already know you. So some would, would be classified as cold calls. Would you say that's accurate? I mean, at this point, uh, most of them do know me, but in the beginning, just like everybody else out there, I didn't know anybody like, so I grew up, I grew up in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn and I moved to California and I said, I'm going to work on my own. And I knew no realtors. I got introduced to two realtors in the beginning. And within a month of meeting them, this is a true story. They broke up. So my first realtor team became one person within like 30 days. So I knew nobody. When I tell you, like, people are like, I don't know who to call. Joe didn't have a friend, a family member, a coworker, nobody. So I was cold. Like I called cold. And, and then I did a lot of events. I did like, Hey, I'm teaching a class about whatever. I'm having a speaker about chat GPT. Um, and that was a good way for me to get warmer introductions. But in the beginning it was cold and I didn't know what I, what I know now. So if I was calling cold, I would literally just call and use that same little script that I just told you like, Hey, we have a lot of, we work with a lot of buyers and we try to help them increase their pre-approval. Like that's every buyer's agent in the world. They want mm -hmm. their client to qualify for more, right? Hey, I specialize in working with whatever you like, right? If you know, if you know a VA lender, they're really good about promoting VA, right? Like they pump it out. I do VA loans. The rest of us non-veterans don't have a target. So my thing is if you're Joe loan officer out there, have that program that you're just going to hammer through, right? DSCRs, or I work on, I help nurses, I help doctors, I help this, I help that, like be specific and just pound that thing. Hey, I help people who are self-employed. I help truck drivers. I help whatever. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a game changer. If you're calling cold, like have a specific ask, mm -hmm. you know, and then be consistent. They're going to send you nothing on the first three or four calls. Just is what it is. Even the best of the best, you know? And send them something of value if you have it, right? Like I've got a couple of cool flyers for buyer's agents. That's a good one to send out that I, I could probably send you guys and just send them something without wanting anything in return, right? Like, hey, here's this. This should help you with your business. You know, whatever cheesy flyer, just give. 
I don't know if you've used First Home IQ in that interaction before, but I've heard from a lot of ambassadors that, um, or, and you know, anybody involved in a nonprofit that um, talking about some kind of educational resource or talking about a, you know, community thing that they're involved in can be a great way to open the door and just build a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, what I've been hearing is like people talking about first time IQ saying, Hey, I'm involved in this nonprofit. It's focused on education. Is it something you'd like to, you know, collaborate on or, or join me on a, a seminar related to understanding how to reach next gen consumers and, and that kind of thing where it's not so directly related. It's just like, Hey, I'm doing, I'm a community leader and it seems to be, you know, I don't know if, if you've been, you know, focused in that area as well. I have. I was actually talking to somebody yesterday or yesterday um, about First Home IQ because she, you know, we were talking about just educating young people and how people in her community, they don't know about credit, about about uh, FICO scores, buying a house, right? Like any of that stuff. Nobody teaches you. Um, you know, I, I say that when I grew up, my mom, my family never talked about money, right? And the reason they didn't teach me about money is we didn't have any money. Like, let's just be honest. Like we were paycheck to paycheck and, and there's a lot of people out there whose parents don't talk to them about money because there's not a lot of money disposable. So there's so many people who need to learn um, about that. And so I think the first home IQ, I've talked to a lot of my referral partners about it. It's a great talking point and it's a great conversation starter, especially when you start the conversation with, Hey, this is Joe. I'm part of this nonprofit and I want to tell you about it. Mm. Like you got to be pretty cold blooded. Anybody to be like, take me off your list. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, I mean, you got to be cold blooded to do that. Don't get me wrong. There are still realtors out there that will do that to Joe, <laughs> uh, but you got to be pretty cold blooded and that's not your person, right? Like if you make that call and they take me off your list, just hang, just move on. That's not your guy. That's not your girl. Like, and that's okay. You know, we just want everybody to love us all the time. Mm, you know? So yeah, I think, I think first home IQ is a great tool. I mean, we've talked about it with, uh, with my, you know, the class in Brooklyn that we helped out and just really getting into that community that we, we did that course with them was huge, right? Like, that's a community I grew up in where kids don't know about money and they don't learn. And you saw like they they literally said, I've never talked to anybody successful. Like, mm -hmm. damn, that's crazy. But that's, there's so many millions and millions of people who don't know anything about finance. Yeah. You know? And this might be a good chance if, if you guys are watching and are not familiar with First Home IQ, just want to share briefly, our focus is on educating and empowering the next generation with financial literacy and homebuyer education. So uh, we approach this by supporting educators. As Joe mentioned, he connected us with a, a class in Brooklyn and we were able to implement a full financial literacy curriculum with them. Uh, we're doing that with schools across the country. And then we support industry professionals through our ambassador program, which includes uh, resources like uh, quizzes, social media content, presentation materials, um, flyers, outreach strategy, scripting, like we were talking about, um, and then media content as well. So if you are interested in learning more about that, you can go to our website, firsthomeiq.com. Uh, but just want to loop everybody into that. Um, we're really excited about the momentum and definitely the support from Joe. Yeah, it's and and for our loan officers out there, right? Like we're starving for stuff to share and teach our clients, our friends and family, and our real estate partners, right? Like this is an opportunity for you to get that from coming from contribution and sharing, guys. And it doesn't happen like you said, Deborah. I want, I'm gonna post on social media and I'm gonna get a top thousand leads. Like it's not gonna happen in a day. You gotta be consistent. And it works, right? You just got to stay at it. You know, you can't eat well for one day and expect to get skinny. It's not going to happen. You're I mean, I'm still gotta... waiting. I'm trying. I'm still that, waiting. I, you know, is there a magic pill? Something. It is. It's Ozempic. I was going to say that, but I oh. didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Sorry. Well, so, Sorry. so just, just to recap a few things from, you know, being the best mortgage advisor, I think we can all agree that it's having a plan and it's winning by noon. 
So whether you adopt Joe's theme days and you have set calls that are already on your calendar so that you get it done and you make sure you get it done before noon, the truth is you've got to do that every day and we have to get proactive on the business. Otherwise we're kind of hoping and praying and we're, we're on our heels. So identify who those calls are going to be for you and, you know, plan it in your weeks and, and make sure that, you know, you get it done. Right. And then the second big takeaway is looking within just from your own resources with your company of what would be considered of value that when you're then making those calls, you have something to talk about and whether it's a nonprofit um, or it's a certain loan program, maybe it's strategies for first time home buyers or, you know, home buying grants, whatever those things are, kind of get a brain dump of that list. So that way, when you go to execute your calls, it can help settle some nerves because you'll, you'll have something of value to share or even inviting them to an event. So first thing is win by noon. And second thing is to look for value within that you can offer. And then third, I kind of wanted to talk about the event that you mentioned, um, are you doing monthly events for agents? Or yes, I am. And so, just to piggyback on what you said, um, what not to say when you're calling <laughs> agents? We'll touch that real quick. First, uh, first two tips: if when you are making those connections, um, I do all of my paperwork, grunt work, loan stuff in the mornings, and then I typically call my loan my agents later on in the day because that's when their days get started. So I've noticed that my pickup rate is much higher if I start at, at like 11 than if I start at nine in the morning. Agents don't want to talk to me at nine in the morning. The other thing you should not tell an agent is we communicate really well and we close on time. Like that's your job. That's the bare minimum, right? Like everybody can close the loan in 15 days now. So that's not the way to get them to remember you. You have to have a specific ask. We do great blank and just, hammer that down all the time. Sorry. So just to backtrack on that. Um, and then what was the question? I forgot what it was. Oh, events, right? Yes. So I do a lot of events. Um, mm. and I am really big on, on getting in front of agents and, and teaching. So I do a webinar every weekend, um, for, for agents and for clients. And so every weekend it's either a first time home buyer webinar a credit webinar, uh, or a budgeting webinar every single weekend. And what I do is I tell my agents that they can invite their clients. So I'm hosting the webinar. I'm going to speak. I'm going to do all the work for you, but you can tell your client, Hey, you're thinking about buying my lender hosts a home buying webinar. Why don't you jump on it? I'll jump on it with you and let's just teach you. Right. That's a great value add because agents are scared to get in front of the camera. They don't have the PowerPoint to do it, right? They don't want to set up the event, right? So if you're doing it and you can invite 50 agents, 100, you can invite every agent in the planet, right? And get them. And even if they don't bring anybody, guys, right? I invited 50 agents and nobody showed up. You made 50 phone calls. You planted 50 seeds, professional seed planter, Joe, right? Like that's it. So I do a lot of those on Zoom and then I do a lot of classes at the board of realtors. So if you're mm -hmm. in whatever market in the country, doesn't matter if you're in Juneau, Alaska, somewhere close to you, they have a Juneau board of realtors, right? They're always looking for stuff to do for their members, right? Connect with them and say, hey, I want to come in and talk about blank, right? whatever it is. And I have a list of classes I can share with everybody of classes that I do um, because we have everything from social media classes to um, building ADUs to credit to um, to CPA classes, right? Sometimes I'll bring in an expert and I'll have like the ADU expert come in and talk or the home inspector come in and talk or appraisers, right? Like if you want a good one, get an appraisal panel and have agents come and grill the appraisals appraisers. Mm, they love that. So, one. They love that. Yeah. They love to beat up on an appraiser. Um, <laughs> so I, again, I'm doing at least I'm doing those webinars on Saturdays every week. Um, but I'm doing at least two classes a month in person. Mm. And are those so just I, for your agent partners or for the clients too? The in person. Those are just for clients. Sorry. Those okay. are just for agents. For the clients, I do a trust seminar, wills and trust, um, and that I do it every quarter. 
So every four, every three months, I do a quarterly, how to protect your ass. That's, <laughs> oh no, it's called who inherits the mess. Sorry. Who inherits the mess. <laughs> and we talk about how to protect your house. Um, I'd love to ask some questions about, you know, how you're communicating with first time home buyers specifically, especially with the NAR settlement and, uh, you know, coming up, like, are you getting ahead of that in any way in the way that you're communicating with first time home buyers or even move up buyers? Um, and then would love to piggyback off of that into some, you know, conversations around how you're using a rent versus zone, but, but starting with that NAR settlement, are you getting ahead of that in any way? So I actually haven't had a lot of people ask me about the NAR settlement, right? I feel like loan officers and realtors, the algorithm, it knows that we're interested in that. So we see it, it's pumped in our faces, but I haven't had a lot of clients asking me about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I am working with my agents to show their value, right? Like I have a professional uh, client presentation. I've done it for years, right? Like it's a PowerPoint, da, 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 da. So I'm one, I started inviting my agents to my presentation so that they can see what a presentation looks like, right? Because listing agents have a good presentation, but buyer's agents, not so much, right? And then the other part is I've got a couple of things that we've created that show here's the value of the agent, right? Like the agent needs to be clear on what their values are because lenders I've been in the business 20 years. I've been getting shopped by clients for 20 years. That's the truth, right? People have beat me up on price since day one when I didn't know anything. So we're used to this competitive, show your value, show your worth, stand out from your competition that now the agents are going to have to do some of that. Like they're, there's no way around it, right? Why am I going to pay you two when this person wants one? Or why am I going to pay you three when this person wants two? So that's what we're working on. I'm doing a realtor mastermind with, with my top 25 where we're talking about that stuff and how to have a solid presentation, what to put in that presentation to show your value, right? More than just I open doors because that's what people think. So that's my big focus here in the next couple of months is Show the help them show their value, help them be prepared to win like today versus July, whatever the heck the date is. It's interesting. You know? I think a lot of people think that you, I, I can't remember who I was hearing talking about this, but that if you get ahead of it with buyers, like they don't necessarily have those anxieties, they're not talking about this all the time, you know. So, um, that can just plant a seed of anxiety that they don't need to add to their plate as buyers. And, um, but going at it, this route is, uh, is yeah, really awesome. So. Yeah. And I think listing agents don't want to do double work if I'm being honest, right? Like if you're a listing agent, you're not charging anything, you're not giving anything to the buyer side. Like everybody's going to want to write their offer with you. You're going to be negotiating against yourself. Somebody's going to be upset that they didn't get the house. Like, a good listing agent is going to tell their seller, you should offer a commission to this person. And I think in most cases, they still will. Occasionally they won't. And and I, I agree with that. I think they will too. I think the, the challenge will be um, because when the buyer's agent gets their rep, you know, agreement signed, if they only agree to pay for 1%, even if the seller's offering a 3% commission towards the agent, they only get what was agreed to on their, you know, rep agreement with the client. So I feel like that's where as a, a mortgage advisor and, you know, leader in the space, getting with your, you know, maybe starting with your VIP agents and really practicing. Like, I mean, even having, whether it's a power hour where everybody's on a Zoom Or the role play just, cards. There you go. Famous plug that. to Phil Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Which, do you know, we're, we're doing, Todd and I have a exactly what to say personal certification in Venice Beach. No, it's at Santa Monica Beach, actually. Oh, really? uh, it's May 21st and May 22nd. So we're doing the same certification that you could get, you know, through Phil in New York. So we've we've become we've gone through training to be certified guides. And I'm so if you know any there. agents, have to be there. yeah, or loan officers, send them because it's he only does them in New York. So I feel like those who are, you know, on the West Coast, that's a long trip. And we're we're a lot less expensive. So um, okay. I'll put the link in the chat, but also feel free to to send that out 
as well. Yeah, that's good. I have, I have a crush on Phil Jones. I I love I love the the word stuff. I know he knows. I met him in person. I I shared my my love for Phil Jones. So it's cool. I could say it here in front of everybody. We're friends. Well, I don't know. I Jones. did. Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I was gonna say I did put um, the recording. So if you guys missed the call that we did this week with Phil about the NAR settlement. Um, there's oh, some people who may not have known that we, we did that. So it started with us just texting him saying we wanted to do this webinar. And then he was like, why don't I just be there with y'all? And we were like, would you do that? <laughs> so I did put in the chat, uh, the recording to the replay, which is also on the win by noon YouTube channel. So you guys definitely take an hour, you know, carve out some so time. Good. And I would listen and re-listen to that because Phil's nuggets of gold are just like you can't write them down fast enough no he's like a jedi it's wild. he really is what i was gonna say is that he did a recording with dave and i on uh, being an ambassador and i hadn't followed his stuff so i i jumped in being like yeah i know everybody loves them but like knowing exactly what to say come on you know <laughs> and, um, and so i was really skeptical and then he and i and i was like he doesn't know our nonprofit, all that and anyway he just like went so wild like i'm still reeling from that. Um, and yeah, there's just so many good scripts for ambassadors or even anybody that like leads with education. He, he rolled with it so well. So definitely check that out. Awesome. Um, okay. So I wanted to ask questions about now on the consumer side, um, you know, as I want to share a few research stats that we gathered a couple months ago with a thousand millennial and Gen Z consumers they are, of course, really skeptical, but skeptical not just of buying a home, but also of industry professionals. Over half say that they don't feel confident that, or they don't trust loan officers or agents to help them make smart decisions about their future. Um, and over half say that they don't feel, they don't think home ownership is within reach. And of course, they're not confident in their own knowledge about personal finance or education. And for me, uh, you know, I hear this constantly among friends and I'm sure Joe, like this is a constant pushback is just like this idea that maybe homeownership isn't a good idea for me, or they're skeptical about whether it's a good idea. And, you know, we don't see this kind of data. We don't see the fact that there's a giant gap between owners and renters in terms of net wealth. Um, so I'd love to hear from you how you're using things like uh, rent versus own to, or, or whatever education you're utilizing to be able to share this kind of information to combat this kind of data, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And that, that, that one hurt my heart. The one I know 50%, 50 don't trust the loan officer, man, that's terrible. Who came up with that? I want to meet those people that were interviewed. Cause that's well, horrible. I don't think they know you. <laughs> they so don't know me. The they don't know Paul and Chris and Deborah. Whoever they know, they know is know not most trust loan officers. You know, Damn, I like horrible. once they meet somebody. Yeah, we get a bad rap. We get a bad rap. Yeah. Um, here's my thing. So I here in here in in Orange County, like the mortgage payments are so large, right? Like it's you're you're talking to people six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollar mortgage payments, like. That's a large number. You have to make a boatload of money to afford a nine thousand dollar mortgage, uh, and so really, you have to dig in. You have to dig into the why. You have to go through the numbers. Like I'm all about the numbers, right? So, going through the the rent versus own, going through the ROI. So I always go through uh, the ROI when talking to clients, and and really try to explain that hey. I don't know what the market's going to do. Let me be, let's be honest. Deborah doesn't know. Kristen doesn't know. Nobody knows if rates are going up or down, right? What we do know is that real estate is the greatest investment in the history of the world. That is a fact. And you don't have to take my word for it. We can look at the ROI, right? And so I have a little ROI spreadsheet that I can, I can put in here and I can, I think I can share um, maybe. And so I keep things super simple. And one of the things that we can do as loan officers is we have access to people's bank accounts, right? Can you see my screen over here? My little spreadsheet? Yes. Super good. simple. And I'll pull up a rent versus own, right? Um, 
but we have access to their bank accounts. So I love the client who's been with B of A or Wells or Chase or Credit Union for forever. I always pick on the credit union people because they're so loyal to the credit union, right? I've been with my credit union for 57 years. And I'll pull up the credit union bank statement. I'll be like, do you love schools first credit union? Whatever. I'll use the right. I'll use the actual name. I don't care. And we do. We love them. And I'll be like, you know what? Schools first loves you more. And they're like, why? And I go, because here's your savings account. And they're giving you 0 0.02 return on that money. 0 0.02. You see that 18 cents you made? Lucky you. That's why they love you. Here's why you need to buy a house. And here's why. Even though interest rates were 7 and 8%, people still lined up to buy. Because when you bought a house, just to use round numbers, at 600000 and let's say you put 5% down. My math didn't calculate there. If that home conservatively went up 2% a year, you put in 30, it goes up 12 you've made 40% ROI. Now, Deborah, is that better than the 0 0.02 that the credit union is giving you? Yes. It is, 100 times out of 100. Guess what's happening? You're putting this $30,000 into the credit union, they're investing it in real estate, and they're making the 40% return, not you. So the reason that even though interest rates were 8% and people were still lining up to buy homes here in Southern California, I don't know about your market, is because your ROI is based on this, not on this. When you put the 30 grand in the bank account, you're only going to get your 0.2 on this versus the growth is here. And if that appreciation is higher, look at this ROI. It's ridiculous, right? So this is why it doesn't matter what interest rates do. This is why people are going to keep buying, right? The other part that you look at, and I show people, and that's why I love mortgage coach, right? Is because this is super simple, right? Using the same little number, even though I'm sure there's somebody out there who will say, there's no $600,000 houses in Orange County. Um, there are. My my average loan amount is not a million dollars. I wish I wish I was in Sean's market. Sean's up there with the million dollar houses. Joe, not so much, um, right? But this shows you this person paying rent at 3,500 bucks a month. Um, if they bought a house at 600, three and a half percent down, they have a mortgage payment of 4,800 bucks. Like the average Joe is like, oh my God, this yeah. is a boatload. I can't afford $4,800. Mm -hmm. But again, when you show the uncle Sam and I will pull up their tax returns and I will show them like, how much did you pay in taxes? Right? Like, let's dig. Don't, this isn't Joe trying to sell you. I, I am not a sales guy. I am a facts over feelings guy. Right, like let's look at the real, real, real numbers, and here's what the tax benefit is. Here's how much of your payment's going to go towards principal. Here's the net monthly payment. I'm not really good at math, right? But this net payment is lower than this actual payment, mm -hmm. and this actual payment is paying your landlord's mortgage, not yours. And you can dig into into down here rent versus principal paid. This is always a good one, especially when somebody's rented for a long time. Like this is the dagger of the daggers. Like, I don't know if you've ever, like anybody out there, if you've ever shared this with somebody and they literally see the number of rent, like I will change this. So if I know they've been renting for eight years at the same place, I will put this eight years <laughs> and that actual number. So I'll be like, so you've been renting from Steve for the last eight years. Here's how much you've paid him in rent, wow. right? Like, so you can see the the rents um, and the, the cash net worth that you have there. And so I'm a big believer in just go through the numbers, right? The numbers never lie. And does it work for everybody? No, right? Like there's some people I get on and they're paying 800 bucks to their mom, right? Mm. Like that's not the truth, but the ROI thing wins every time, like- hundred times out of a hundred, they see it and they go, Dang. and even the people who are really, really good. Cause I deal with the engineer and the financial planner, right? Like the guy who has it all figured out. And that guy who's really good in his high yield savings account is getting 4.5. It is not 40 or zero. So 
you know, again, even if an agent can teach that to people and show people like that's the why, mm. you know, and I feel like that's the most powerful thing. Like when I'm talking to people is showing them the financial investment and how the payment, you know, yes, the payment is probably higher than your, your rent, but the tax benefit and everything else is going to save you money, you know? So that's a little bit about how I do it. I mean, I've got a whole presentation that I go through with, I keep them engaged for 45 minutes. I, I own them once I get them on Zoom. That's amazing. I mean, there's a ton of anxiety that consumers have coming to the table. We're hearing all these messages that homeownership is out of reach. And we, you know, are, I, I even I felt that way when I was buying a home here a few years ago. And it, it wasn't until I saw the data myself and was able to see like, here's really what I'm paying in rent. And here's, here's really what I could be building with homeownership. And it's, it's hard to even tell someone that without them seeing the data. So um, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Super helpful. I would love to see, um, can you share that rent versus own so that that's like an example that we could have in the community? Yeah, yeah for okay. sure. I can definitely, and I, I can share anything. Well, I don't know if there's ways to post it, but I'll, I'll share spreadsheets and I think oh, amazing. Okay, that, list that was great. Of, the other thing that people, it, could, could you put it not only in the, the Zoom chat, but also um, if you're willing in the file section of the Facebook group of your, your yeah. list of classes? Because I did see someone ask about that, your spreadsheet and maybe your presentation. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll put that in the First Home IQ community as well. That's just such a, this is the kind of content that we need to be sharing that's that's showing people how to build wealth through homeownership. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I will share. I mean, I'll I'll share the links, and if anybody has questions, you could always DM me or send me a message. I am, I am an open book. Like I, I think we all want to win, right? We all want. I've had lots of people help me over the years, right? Jeremy Forcier has helped me over the years, and Hunter, and all of these great people. Um, so I will share whatever I have, and if you have questions on it or you want to ask me, I'm I'm an open book. Wow, thank you. <laughs> and I, I want to point out too, as you were going through that, um, I think it's important, like telling isn't selling. And a lot of times, even on social, I see the whole like show up and throw up in, in using acronyms that people are like, I don't even know what DTI, FICO, LTV, like it can be very over someone's head and showing the graphics, like demonstrating is so powerful, whether it's them on a zoom and you're doing a buyer consult or don't forget also on social because people are naturally a little skeptical. I mean, let's face it. Now, anybody can be an expert or guru and post whatever they want online. And some of it looks very professional and it's edited, you know, nicely where they think that that's like gospel. And so, um, mm -hmm. or you have the people that are, have been online and they've been consuming and they've been thinking about buying a home for a while, but now it's like, I don't know who to trust because I mean, even with economists, you could listen to a multiple different economists and they all say something different depending on where they are on the oh. planet. Right? So, you know, having the data to me, it helps validify that you are just sharing truth and you're sharing information. You're not what Phil would say is leading the witness and, and trying to persuade, um, for a, a, a motive for you to benefit and which truth be told, guys, that's how you're looked at. Like you're still looked at as a salesperson. Like, of course you're going to tell me to buy because you make money when, whenever people buy homes. So I think it's important to just show the data through a mortgage coach or through an Excel spreadsheet like you had so that it, it anchors in the message and you don't lose people just because of the messenger that the, the message gets lost. So, um, yeah. that write that down as your next piece of homework. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Say that again. I said, 50% don't trust loan officers. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. If they saw that, they might trust you more. So but you're, you're right. And I think if you come across Deborah as like salesy, mm -hmm. like, cause they do, people think every realtor is going to tell you to buy and every lender is going to tell you to buy. Right. And yeah, for the, there are a lot of people who sound salesy and that's like it, the market's great. Like the market's not great for everybody. Like, let's just be honest that six, seven, eight, nine, $10,000 payment's not great for everybody. Right. But for those who can, or as Phil would say, this might not be for you, but see, that was good. Phil line. <laughs> it um, was good. That was good. I just pulled that out of my, you know what? <laughs> um, you can say ass. You're ass. with it. Pulled it out like of my I'm ass. Raw. <laughs> That's right. I pulled it from out of my ass. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you have to be authentic, right? And people can tell that you are looking out for their best interest. That's the key. Like you got to keep your eye on that. Like maybe they can't afford the $5,000 payment, but maybe the $4,000 payment is what they can afford. And just buy a house, like get something because you got to get in the game, you know, at some point, otherwise you're in that rat race of rent. Well, and even my niece, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of her and, and their, so her and her husband, they have two homes to sell because they had homes before they got married. And in their mind, even though they have two that have been in the mortgage space for a long time, they thought, surely if we sell these two homes that are in the 2% interest rate, you know, for a monthly payment, surely we could buy like a million dollar home because we'll take the proceeds from these two. And, you know, even with today's interest rate market, like surely we'd have about the same monthly payment as we do on one of the the properties we have now. And I was like, yeah. um, so just your taxes and insurance alone in Texas is going to be on a million dollar property versus the 400,000 that was originally like 300,000 when you bought a couple of years ago, it, it's not going to be a wash. And so in their mind, they had a comfort zone of like 3,500 a month payment and the thought of when I was initially running numbers for them of going to like, you know, a five, $6,000 a month payment, although they could afford it according to yeah. their debt to income ratio in their mind, they were like, oh, but we've been living off of, you know, only paying this amount because they had a renter in a, in a different property. And I was like, but you can afford it. And let's look at where your other money is going. Like, do, do you really need all these subscriptions and do you really need and, you know, we were talking before this call, like I'm the worst when it comes to Uber Eats. But if you were to look at my total bill from Uber Eats in a year or the fees that I pay, it's like, would you rather have that nicer, bigger home that you need for your family because you just had a baby? And would that be worth more? Which, by the way, that's also appreciating. So sometimes it is just poking holes in their belief of what they think they can afford. Now, obviously, you don't want to stretch people too far if it's beyond their means, but I think that's that's one aspect to kind of poke. And then two, for so many first time home buyers, from what I hear, it's it's the exit strategy. Like it's in their mind, they think it's a 30 year commitment. Like I can't, some of them still rent their clothes or don't even, they can't even think of how to get out of a car loan, which may be six years. So if I sign papers on a home, that must mean I'm committing for 30 years. And I don't know who I want to be yet or where I want to live and like plant roots. So I think also yeah. for some, if it's their first home, a part of the strategy could be, you know, then keeping the home and renting it out or how you can exit. Um, because in their mind, they, they think of leasing or renting. That's a heck of a lot easier than the commitment yeah. of buying. There's no commitment. There's no commitment. You just leave when yeah, you want. When I, when I got my rent versus zone, I couldn't even look at the five or 10 years. I was like, I need to know three years. I, I can, you know, let's look at two or three years. <laughs> and of course, once I'm in it, I'm like, uh, I want to be here as long as possible. But, um, but yeah, it's that mindset that is difficult to transition. Um, okay. So with just a few minutes left, I did want to get like, kind of try to summarize some things, um, as, like, what are some of the steps or criteria to being the, what did we call it? Best mortgage best. advisor on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure, Joe. Hey, you pick the topic, buddy. Dude, I know, that's not how I delivered it. I'm going to blame Paul right there. Paul, who said nothing. I like is, it. Well, it's, you're away. delivering. So. Um, so here's what it comes down to, right? I, I And I kind of thought after I saw the email, I thought I like, I better think about this. I know what I was. So it is being, you know, the worst time to think about what you're going to say is in the moment. Okay. Anyways. In the moment. Yeah. Is, is being valuable, right? Is, is that's the number one thing. And we have to be more valuable. Like I said earlier for our agents. And so, um, I jotted down a couple of things as far as what loan officers can do to be more valuable, right? And first one is helping them with their business. That's number one, whether it's social media or having a scripts or helping them record, giving them content, right? Like helping them be more present, um, doing those webinars like I talked about, right? Like that will help them because you're doing the webinar. You're just letting them invite their people. Um, helping them get leads is the second thing, right? So I don't pay for leads. I don't do Zillow's or any of that stuff, but my job is to ask for leads on behalf of the agent. So when I meet with the client the first time, first initial meeting, 
I make four promises to them. And I say, if I do these four things, can you do me one small favor? I think that's another Phil one. One small favor in return. Sure, Joe, they always say yes, because it's non-committal. Once you buy your house and you get keys, me and your realtor are officially unemployed. So all that I ask is that when we close, if we do these four things, that you will refer us a friend, a family member, a coworker, or somebody just like you who would benefit from working for us. Is that fair? Cool. They always say yes. I do it again when they get in contract. I do it again when they're CTC'd. I do it again on my 30-day call, on my 60-day call, on my 360 call. Six different times I'm asking for leads for the realtor because they want to give the realtor a lead more than they want to give me a lead. Let's just be honest. But if they give the realtor a lead, odds are that lead's coming back to me. So helping them get leads and being super strategic. Um, I have a couple of spreadsheets that, as far as things that they should add to their buyer's uh, uh, consultation. So I'll send you that as far as knowing their knowing their value, because I think that's huge and helping them with that buyer's consultation and inviting them to yours so that they can see um, doing realtor masterminds. So getting your top agents and brainstorm on how to win, right? Like collaboration with top players and bringing them in. I do a mastermind once a month. I do two once a month with my top agents and we talk about how to win in this market. Um, and then train them, do the, do role plays, talk with them, have the hard conversations that they're going to have with their clients, right? Like be invested in their business because if your business, my business is dependent on realtors, like hundred percent. So guess what happens? If my realtors can't get that agreement signed, I am out of business. Joe can't be out of business. I got a kid in college. I got another one in private school, sports. Like I got to keep working. So we have to help them so that they can close business so that we can close business, right? And you have to remember that um, and be invested in that, guys. Like it's, it's important because if not, if they don't have the confidence, they're not going to get leads. They don't get leads we're done. So that's my, that's how you can be the most valuable and best loan officer on the planet for your realtor partners. In my oh, own opinion. So good. Thank you so much for sharing and being so open with your resources. Um, I do want to mention for those who are ambassadors or interested in being ambassadors, we have presentation materials, um, a lot of resources that are available to support your relationship with realtors and first time home buyers. Um, and Deb, thank you so much for letting me join you on this call too. Yeah. I well, know I feel and, special. I feel special. I had both ladies, by the way. Yes, you should. <laughs> um, um, Dave, I was like thinking Dave was going to be good, but you guys are way better. I Way mean, better day. Have any Take doubt? That. Come on. No. Uh, but I, I was going to tell you, Joe. I think uh, since you are an ambassador, this time of year is when teachers are like inundated with state testing, and so if you are trying to get your survey link filled out, know that um, a lot of times kids, once everyone has finished the test, there's like nothing to do for the rest of the day, and it's it's awful as a teacher because you're you're staring at like no one can even have their cell phones until every test is put away and so you're you're there like staring at each other counting the ceiling tiles and so that could be one activity that they do for their class once you know everyone's finished because otherwise they have nothing else they're just reading a book but then also with that um once state testing is done especially for some of the seniors and juniors there's not really like heavy curriculum to teach because at that point you've you've taught everything that the state has required and now you've been tested on it and teachers are exhausted. So if you have presentations or lesson plans, like this is actually the best time to then go in because teachers need the help. And, you know, it, it's material that you all have that they don't have to think about. So just a thought That's for you. Huge. That's good to yeah, know. I love that. Yeah. Love this it. is a tough time to like crack the code with teachers when they're, when it's test time, simply because they are, I mean, you're trying to cram down kids' throats and you're like hoping that they will take it seriously when it comes to test time. But then from here on out, it's like game over. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks you guys. If you are watching this live um, on Facebook, make sure you give it a like, put some comments for us as Joe and Dave and Todd will like to see that. Go ahead and let them know that, um, you know, the women and Joe, we just like rushed it. Yeah. And, and then if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, 
know that you can hit the little bell. I think sometimes we hear hit the subscribe button, but some people have asked, what is Dave talking about? So there's a bell icon and, and then it will notify you every time a new interview is posted, which I'm pretty sure that's um, every single call that Dave ever has. He just does it on Zoom now, like every phone call throughout the day and goes live. So it's smart. Um, but thank you all for investing in the time. Now make sure that you take action. And thank you again, Joe and Kristen, for helping uh, provide value for those who tuned in today. Y'all have a great weekend. Bye, Bye. Ray. Oh, yeah. <laughs>